holy. Because, because I'd seen the vision. I saw the glory. I saw the people. I, I saw the holy and righteous. And I said, Lord, I will do it. And since I said I will, if I, if I don't want to do something, even with a human being, if you talk to me and I understand you, and I say, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that. When I say I don't want to, I never understand my background. I was trained by an atheist who never believed in God. And we stood eyeball to eyeball. And when he said, that's your learning, when he said, do this, you can flog me from here till that time. He did. Blood was gushing out. I have the mark in my body today. And he said, William, I said, sir, do this. I said, no, sir. Continue to beat me until when he was tired, he left me. Three weeks after, I went back. I said, sir, three weeks ago, do you remember me? He said, yes. I said, look at the mark here. It's on my hand here. I said, I came to tell you once again. I didn't do that thing. And I'll not do that thing. He said, my boy, I am sorry. And for that man to say I'm sorry to a teenager like me at that time, that was something. I wasn't even born again. But my name is William, a defender of the faith, a defender of the truth. And when I stand and I say, this is what the Lord has told me, and this is where I'm going, there might be a thousand lions in the way. I will get there. And you need to have the same mind and the same speed that this man said what the Lord called him for. If you're going to join me, join hands with me, and then raise up this thing. I'm the one that saw the vision. I'm the one that saw the people. I'm the one that saw that this is the kind of church the Lord wants to raise up through me. I told you, you didn't see the vision. If you're going to join hands with me and we do it together, well and good, but if you don't want to, why don't you find another church and say the holiness in that church is too much, the standard in that church is too much, the sanctification in that church is too much, and find another place because in this place is going to be the gateway to heaven. This place is going to be a place where raising up people that will have the mass of the true Christian church. And anyone that joins me, that wants to say, will do it with you, I say, come along. And if I see that spirit in you, the same spirit, the same heart, and the same excitement, and the same sanctification, and the same consecration, will walk along together. But immediately I see that this one came to destroy my vision. It came to destroy what the Lord gave me. I'll just pack you aside and go my way because when I go before the Lord Almighty on that final day, He's going to ask me, what did you do with the vision I gave you? And I can say from 1973 to 2011 and 12 that God, I thank you as long as it's in my hand. I've done my best to make the church what you called me that it will be. Some people have loved me and some people have hated me. Some people have come near. Some people have gone away. I've had some people that have very close to me. I never knew I could leave one day without their support, but they have gone, and I'm still here. I'm going stronger and stronger, and in the name of Jesus, I'll still be keeping strong until the final end in Jesus' name. If you want to come, and if you want to say, we're going to build that same church together, wonderful. And then, but if you say, no, we're not going to, we're going to ruin it. If God shows me, I'll say, sir, can you find your way to another place? Madam, can you find your place or another place? Because over here, we're going to do something that will have a mark of the true Christian church. And it's going to be like that in Jesus' name. That's why it says over here that he gave himself. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. And then to purify unto himself a peculiar people, a transformed church. And that is what this church will remain to be in Jesus' name. You need to understand, I have colleagues who are also leaders of other churches. I have colleagues who are overseers of other churches. We're very friendly. We're together. But you know, those early years, we just walked together and we led together and we did this together. Yeah, I mean, a lot of them. But right now, when I saw that this is the way they are going, and you know, we still greet each other. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. And we still, you know, we still socialize a little bit. But then I said, this is the direction I'm going. Now, if I do that to those colleagues of mine that were together before, and I say no because they are not following after. What
what the Lord has called me for. And then you are now, this is your own chance now to prove yourself, to say that you have the same mind, you have the same attitude, you have the same goal, and you have the same passion in your heart that we're going to go together. But once I see that this one has come to destroy me, this one has come to hinder me, this one has come to model up the great work that I sacrifice everything I've got, I sacrifice it for. You think I'm going to be foolish? No, not at this old age, this old age, everything that God has given me unto the very end, I'm going to keep in Jesus' name. I might lose you, I'd rather lose you and keep heaven. I might lose you there, I'd rather lose you and keep heaven because this church, the true Christian church, that we're raising up only the people that have that same mind we're going to do it together in Jesus' name. I go to point number two, that's the consecration, consecration, the consecration and also the absolute surrender. Consecration and absolute surrender unto the Lord. I'm looking at 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. Let's see what consecration looks like. What real absolute surrender looks like. It tells us in 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 15. It says, And the king, and the king's servant said unto the king, Behold thy servants. Are ready to do whatsoever my Lord the King shall appoint. They said, We don't have any will of our own. Our will is swallowed up in your will. Our desires, they are swallowed up in your desire. We were your servants, and were your slaves, and were your followers, were your disciples. And we are willing to do whatsoever, whatsoever, my Lord, the King, shall appoint. And when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you recognize him as King of kings, as Lord of lords, and there you say, oh Lord, here am I, what am I living for? Whatever it is in my hand, I'm not going to allow something good to hinder something that is better. I'm not going to allow mundane things of this life and the superficial things of this life to hinder the things that are deep and supernatural and spiritual and therefore whatsoever thou shalt command in my life. It may affect my character, might affect my family, might affect my profession, might affect my education, might affect whatever it is. Whatsoever my Lord the King shall command, shall appoint. I'm not going to look at how does it affect mommy? How does it affect daddy? How does it affect my dear? How does it, how does it affect my honey? How does it affect my wife? How does it affect my husband? Whatsoever the Lord the King shall command. That I will do. That's consecration. Not the people that, you know, will preach the word and will see black and white in the word of God. And then if I follow this, what will my wife say? If I follow this, what will my husband say? I have these children. And then I made this consecration before they came into the world. But now my little boy is telling me, Daddy, why is it like that? And then my little girl, 13 years of age, 14 years of age, is telling me, Daddy, we cannot follow that. We cannot follow it to deeper life. We cannot follow it here and there. And then they're saying, oh, you know, Pastor, I don't want to lose these children. I'd rather lose heaven than lose my children. I'd rather lose holiness than lose, than lose, uh, uh, than lose and lose my children. My children say that they can't follow this repentance. My children say that this kind of music that we have, that is just to give us heart to sing and then to be thinking about heaven. They say that kind of music is not all right for them. They say it's the jazz and the drumming and the dancing and all those uh, things they do. They say that is what they want. And they say this kind of, you know, a submissive life, a subdued life, a humble life, and then an appearance that makes you like, almost like Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then you are not looking like Jesus. They say, we can't, we can't, we can't go on with this. Pastor, what are we going to do? Why don't we change this to accommodate my children? You mean that we should change the standard of the word of God for millions of people because of your little daughter? Think about that. Think about that. They say, because of my daughter and because of, you know, these girls, they are saying, who are those girls? They study the Bible? Who are those girls? They know the original language of the Bible? Who are those girls? Have they met Jesus Christ? Have they seen the third heaven? Have they gone to heaven like Paul the Apostle coming back? Because of these girls, Pastor, if we can modify this and modify this for you, for the whole church, is that not selfish? Is that not wickedness to change the word of God? And millions will go to hell because of you. Why don't you rather deny yourself and whatever you will do? God gave us grace. I came from a background that I can't tell you all the story. And yet when I came out, 
I went through quite a lot to be able to say, this is the revelation of the word of God. The preaching sanctification, you think it's easy? I was, in a, I was in a church in London, they invited me. And I preached and preached and preached on holy sanctification. At the table the following day, we were eating. And then the people, they began to make fun. Somebody said, I saw John Wesley tonight in my dream. And then he was preaching the holiness. And then the other people were making fun. And I looked at them. And I said, you know, you don't play that kind of pranks with me. You don't, you, if, if you come to the table, you don't take the Bible, the word of God. I will say you're a minister in other church. I said, if you don't want it, we want it in Africa. And so I came back and I kept on preaching what I was preaching. That hasn't changed me. And if I can do that with those white people, and I told them, this is where I stand, the word of God. And then you come over here, you are black, like I'm black. I'm likely to, I'm, I'm likely to be more educated than you are. Likely to have read the Bible more than you have read. And likely to have, you know, prayed more than you have prayed. And then you are now coming with your lack of understanding. And then you say, this and this. When you do that over there, just abandon them. I pray that I will not abandon you. That we will stand on the watch of God. And when we preach that word, if it strikes your life, if it cuts your life, if it does anything to you, you don't make fun of the Bible, of the word of God. You go on your face before the Lord. I'm the guilty one. The word of God is right. The doctrine of the word of God is true and faithful. I am the guilty one. I'm the one to repent. That means that your will is submissive, is swallowed up in the will of God. Not that you are trying to twist the hand of God and twist the mind of God and twist the word of God to suit ourselves. That's why the people said we recognize what consecration is, we recognize what absolute surrender is. And over here they said, your, they serve, the king's servants, and they said unto him, Behold, thy servants are ready. We're ready. I said we're ready. I didn't know those, you know, that day when the Lord showed me this great revelation and he said, this is what you do. And, uh, you know, I was uh, going to give up, uh, you know, uh, be, becoming a professor and doing this and doing that. And the Lord demanded something of me. And I said, Lord, I give everything. I, I, I not even read this verse at that time, but I said the same thing. I said, what do I have? What do I know? And they called me, whatever they called me then, first class brain, whatever. And I said, I don't, all that brain, I put it at the cross. And all the future, I put it at the cross. All the prospects, I put it at the cross. All the sending me over since I put it at the cross. And I said, Lord, I lay down because I saw a vision. If you saw the same vision, you'll give up anything. I think the reason why we're not consecrated and surrendered to the Lord is because you know we're so dull and we're so blind and our eyes and sight is so dim and we cannot see you've not seen it if you go back to the cross and you go to the altar and the Lord shows you the all and he shows the revelation of the future you'll drop uh, all these uh, minor things and little things superficial things uh, trans uh, transitory things that we're trying to hold on to you'll drop it in a moment and I pray that at this time that consecration will come upon your life in Jesus name and those things will drop down you say, I'll never go back to them anymore in Jesus' name. See, since I dropped all those things, my mind never went back to them. And, you know, I, uh, great things, things that, you know, people are saying, how could you have that and just drop that and just drop that? I said, because there's a higher calling. There's a greater calling. And that greater calling, when it comes upon your life, that's exactly what you're going to do. You don't be arguing with the Lord for one week and one month and one year and five years and ten years. Who are you arguing with? King of kings and Lord of lords. That you should be able to say, I consecrate. I lay everything upon the altar. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost coming from heaven come to burn everything away. He'll do that to your life in Jesus' name. I'm looking at the book of the kings. I'm looking at uh, this one now in uh, 1 Kings chapter 20. 1 Kings chapter 20. And I'm reading there from verse 4. I'm reading 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 4. Here is consecration. And there is what we say to the king of kings and the lord of lords and the master of our faith and the master of our soul, the captain of our salvation. In 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 4, it says, And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. He said, My will is surrendered to you. The consecration that he wants us to bring together 
together as a real church. I cannot imagine any disciple of Jesus Christ telling him, hey, Lord, that is too much. We cannot surrender that. That is too much. We cannot give up that. That is too much. We cannot offer that to you. In fact, when the people say it's too hard for them, this is too much of a sin. How can we receive this? Jesus said to the people, see others have gone. Will you also go back? That's the cause. And then Peter said to whom shall we go? You have the word of life eternal. Sometimes they can come to you that the Lord is saying, well, if that is too tough for you, will you go back? There are other churches out there in Nigeria, in Africa. There are thousands of denominations and churches. And that church is simple, and that church is easy, and that church is easy on their people. Why don't you go there? I can even tell you that if you come to me for counseling. I can do like now me to Ruth. And then you say, Pastor, you know, I've been in this church now for some time, but you know, it, I don't know what is happening. My flesh is saying that, can I endure this? And my children are saying, can I, I can even suggest to you, well, Papa has gone back. Why don't you also go back? Has gone back to our people. Why don't you go back to your people? And after all, so and so is your cousin, so and so is your uncle. He has a church. Why don't you go and attend this church? I can attend that to you. I can say that to you. And it will be a test on your faith. And then you'll be able to say like Ruth, don't tell me, don't entreat me to go back. When you die, I will die. And it was when Naomi saw the consecration, the absolute surrender of this Ruth that she left you. And look, look at the result of that consecration. And it is why you are able to say that whatever happened, whatever the wind may be, I'm going to stand upon the word of God. That is when the power of God will come upon your life again. Give me a good amen. Yeah. You, you know, sometimes, and I need to tell you this, some of our pastors, maybe if this is you, just allow me to talk, allow me to preach. They come to me and they say, Pastor, lay your hands on me and pass the anointing to me. I say, pass the anointing. They don't understand. They said, I said, you know, Elijah passed on the anointing to Elijah. They don't understand. They don't understand. They think that, you know, you make all this consecration. They have no consecration. You make all this surrender. They have no surrender. And they make all, you make all the sacrifices. They have no sacrifices to make and they're still feeling big and feeling great. And they say, you know, Pastor, you are getting older. Why don't you just lay hands on me and pass the anointing to me? It doesn't come like, look at Elisha. Elisha just followed. He left all the yoke of oxen and abandoned everything. All he was doing was pouring water on Elijah's son. Pouring water on Elijah. He wasn't even preaching. He wasn't even prophesying. He wasn't even working miracle. Just pouring water. He was a big man. He was a person, a landowner. He was a person that had this great kind of outfit in doing his work. But he wasn't thinking, he was just pouring water on Elijah. And he said, what's happening to you? What, what came upon you? You aim. Look at this Elijah. He doesn't know the profession you have. He doesn't know the profession you have. He said, don't worry, don't worry. And then he said, the Lord is going to take your master away from your head today. He said, hold your peace, hold your peace. This is not time for discussion. It is time for me to lay everything down. He was checking and searching himself. He said, anything I've seen not laid down. Yes, I know I've abandoned all my oxen. I've abandoned all my profession. I've abandoned everything. But now, what is it that is left? And then eventually, this man of God said, Elisha, you know what? To Day, I'm going to be taken away from you. For if it was some of us, because so familiar with the leader that you say, you're just telling me now, what kind of leadership is that? You'll be keeping that away from me. I knew that. And you didn't trust me. And you need to understand that I be, look at everything I learned, and you are just telling me at this late hour. They told me already. I knew that already. Elisha didn't say that. Don't allow familiarity or nearness to the leader to make us, you know, why didn't you tell me that? Why didn't you say that? And because we begin to, you know, smile at you, you became offended. Is that leader-disciple relationship? Are you equals? Are you colleagues? Elisha said, I need a double portion of your spirit. And instead of the man saying, you've consecrated, you've left everything, and then it's going to happen, kneel down, let me lay hands on you. The man said, if you see me what I'm taking away from you. The man wasn't offended. This is what you call consecration. This is what we call absolute surrender. And then when he was going, he didn't even say, I give you anything. He just threw the man to, and the man understood that man 